Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Sad Cypress by Agatha Christie. This is the Fontana Books edition. This is one of the few uh, Agatha Christie books that until this point I hadn't read. I think I've only got a half dozen left now. As usual, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Eleanor flushed. Will you ask me, again, did I kill Mary Gerard? Poirot rose to his feet. He said quickly, I shall ask you nothing. There are things I do not want to know. But even Hercule Poirot sometimes deceived himself. He did want to know, badly. In the end, Poirot was reluctantly forced to bring all his wits into action to solve this grimly fascinating crime. So here we start right away with um, a common Agatha Christie trope. Uh, the anonymous letter, so part one, chapter one. An anonymous letter! Eleanor Carlyle stood looking down at it as it lay open in her hand. She'd never had such a thing before. It gave one an unpleasant sensation. Ill-written, badly spelt, on cheap pink paper. This is to warn you, it ran. I'm naming no names, but there's someone sucking up to your aunt, and if you're not careful, you'll get cut out of everything. Girls are very artful, and old ladies are soft when young ones suck up to them and flatter them. What I say is you'd best come down and see for yourself what's going on. It's not right you and the young gentleman should be done out of what's yours. And she's very artful, and the old lady might pop off at any time. Well, wisher. Dun dun dun. Somebody calls some people uh, impudent young jack and apes, which is amazing. And Eleanor here says sharply, Aunt Agatha's advice column, keep your boyfriend guessing. Don't let him be too sure of you. I wonder if that was a little sort of, I'm sure Agatha Christie didn't write advice columns, you know, but I wonder if she deliberately used her own name or whether there was uh, an Aunt Agatha advice column out there. Uh, and then there, some of the characters are talking about a man, and Nurse Hopkins says, hmm, he wouldn't be my fancy. One of those men who are finicky in a bundle of nerves. Fussy about their food too, as likely as not. Men aren't much at the best of times. Oh no, I have anxiety disorder and I'm vegan. Does that mean Nurse Hopkins would hate me? And then we get um, a letter here from Jessie Hopkins. She says, uh, they couldn't marry. He'd got a wife in a lunatic asylum. So now you see, we know all about it. Curious the way things come about, isn't it? Considering the easy way you get divorces nowadays, it does seem a shame that insanity shouldn't have been a ground for it then. Letters are kind of uh, a continuing sort of light motif throughout these as well, so you'll, you'll see several letters from start to finish. There's a place called Maidensford as well, which makes me think of like Maidenhead. And um, we get this little conversation here on the subject of Maidensford and British politics. The house is really sold then. Yes, to a major Somerville. Our new member, Sir George Kerr, died, you know, and there's been a by-election. Returned unopposed, said Mrs. Bishop grandly. We've never had anyone but a Conservative for Maidensford. You see, to me, that isn't something to be proud of. I mean, I'm not a Conservative um, person, but surely the, the good thing about democracy is that places can change. Like, it, it's a bad thing if you've only ever had a leader in any political party, surely you should be open to change to try and find the best way of living for people, you know? Okay, and then people are eating paste sandwiches and they become quite an important part of the plot. Uh, paste sandwiches give me like horrible flashbacks to when I was a kid because my, my parents used to make me paste sandwiches and give, give them to me to take to school and they were just vile things. So, um, I used to feed them to the birds, but here, for example, is what you're imagining. Like, paste is just like all of this stuff, like, smushed together, basically, and you spread it. What would you like? Salmon and shrimp, turkey and tongue, salmon and sardine, ham and tongue. And then someone says, in spite of their names, I always think they taste much alike. Yes, they taste of death. Then we get a character here. Um, she finds her dad and mum's marriage certificates in St Albans, 1919. But nurse. The other looked up sharply. She saw the distress in the girl's eyes. She said sharply, What's the matter? Mary Gerard said in a shaky voice, Don't you see, this is 1939 and I'm 21. In 1919 I was a year old. That means, that means that my father and mother weren't married till, till afterwards. It means she's a bastard. So, uh, Poirot doesn't come into it until part two, and uh, I'm just going to read you the introductory paragraph to part two. Um, it's a very typical description of Poirot. Hercule Poirot, his egg-shaped head gently tilted to one side, his eyebrows raised inquiringly, his fingertips joined together, watched the young man who was striding so savagely up and down the room, his pleasant, freckled face puckered and drawn. 
And Poirot says, I can assure you, my friend, that anyone who has once committed a murder finds it only too easy to commit another. And then Nurse Hop Hopkins talking about Mr. Roderick Wellman. Uh, and this is a very ironic as well. He's a nice enough young fellow. Nervy though. Looks as though he might be dyspeptic later on. Those nervy ones often are. So Roderick Wellman might not be a well man. Uh, but also it shows the nurse again. Just judging people based on their nerves, I guess. It was a different time. And uh, here we get the start of chapter four, a very typical attitude towards foreigners, uh, both at the time and in Christie's works. In the awesome majesty of Mrs. Bishop's black clad presence, Hercule Poirot sat humbly insignificant. The thawing of Mrs. Bishop was no easy matter. For Mrs. Bishop, a lady of conservative habits and views, strongly disapproved of foreigners. And a foreigner most indubitably Hercule Poirot was. Her responses were frosty and she eyed him with disfavor and suspicion. Uh, but then she decides that she does like him after all because um, he's been, um, yeah, he's like been, he's been hosted by royalty. Um, yeah, he recounted with na naive pride a recent vi visit of his to Sandringham. He spoke with admiration of the graciousness and delightful simplicity and kindness of royalty. And then after that, she's like, oh, well, actually, maybe he's not such a bad chappy after all. So we get this little interesting paragraph here. Oh, quite. That goes without saying. Ellen is an exquisite creature, beautifully poised and balanced, no violence in her nature. She's intellectual, sensitive, and altogether devoid of animal passions. But get 12 fat-headed fools in a jury box, and God knows what they can be made to believe. After all, let's be reasonable. They're not there to judge character, they're there to sift evidence. Facts, facts, facts. And the facts are unfortunate. We get a very typical Poirot thing here. Poirot rose and made a gesture. Everything, he said, is easy to Hercule Poirot. And then uh, we get this exchange as well. She stared at him. Then slowly a queer little smile came to her lips. She said, You must be an incredibly simple man. Don't you realise how easy it is for me to lie to you? Hercule Poirot said placidly, It does not matter. She was puzzled. Not matter? No. For lies, mademoiselle, tell a listener just as much as truth can. Sometimes they tell more. Come, now, commence. You met your housekeeper, the good Mrs Bishop. She wanted to come and help you. You would not let her. Why? We get someone in the jury box during a trial, they say, how queer, when anyone says what's true, they strike it out. So yeah, overall, as you can probably tell, I did enjoy Sad Cypress. It was a pleasure to get back to reading uh, some Poirot because I've pretty much read all of Agatha Christie's works now. This was a fairly typical entry. I mean, it's nothing special to go really out of your way for, but you will definitely want to get uh, to it if you want to read all of her works, obviously. Uh, I would still give it a pretty solid four out of five. I enjoyed it. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Sad Cyprus by Agatha Christie. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.